Good morning and afternoon, everyone. Thank you for participating in this digital lab university discussion. We're very excited to interact with you today during this session. So if you have any questions throughout the set, uh, discussion, please use the chat function and we'll make sure we address them accordingly. So a quick word on the CGI before we begin. Uh, since 1976, CGI has been an innovative NT and IT and business consulting service partner through our client proximity business model. So drawing upon our global capabilities, we work side by side with our clients to identify, develop, implement, and operate and execute the strategies and solutions needed to meet their customers and constituents' expectations. CGI is one of the few firms with a scale and reach and the capability to successfully execute digital transformation initiatives. About 400 offices across 40 countries, including 85,000 members, service trusted partners to over 5,000 clients globally. And with more than four decades of sustained growth, we provide focused expertise in 10 industries and augment our services with over 175 IP-based solutions. So before we begin, let's get to know our panel of experts. Uh, Simon, can we start with you, please? Sure, hi, I'm Simon Williams. I'm based in the UK. I'm one of CGI's higher education subject matter experts. My specialisms are think smart, sustainable, and the digital campus. Hello, I'm Michael Matney. I'm uh, vice president in CGI for our US uh, Global Technology Operations Group. I've got over 30 years experience in Department of Defense as, uh, and uh, seven years of experience in the commercial markets in cybersecurity. Hi, my name is Derek Shaves. I'm a subject matter expert in web accessibility and diversity and inclusion at UMass Medical School. I have over a decade experience in designing and building projects for human service agencies um, that are accessible and usable by people with disabilities. And hi, everybody. My name is Jim Thalen. I most recently served in higher education as the Vice Chancellor for Strategic Initiatives and Chief Legal Officer at the University of Maine System. I'm now doing uh, higher education consulting on an independent basis. And of all of our panel here today, I am the least steeped in digital uh, technology uh, expertise, but uh, we'll be uh, helping Steve moderate the program uh, from the higher perspective of, of higher education generally. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jim. So, and I am Steve Kahn, CGI Director of Higher Education uh, Consulting Services and your co-moderator for today's uh, discussion. And so, Jim, you know, would you mind, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. So, and before we dive in with Jim, um, so annually, a CGI facilitate a voice of the client initiative where we interview, compile, and present cross-industry challenges and perspective data points from our executive level clients in IT and business. In the last couple of years, we saw very similar data points as well as overlapping priorities from business and IT executives. So in summary, leveraging innovation and digital transformation to improve customer and constituent experiences, increase efficiencies and security fortifications are among the top priorities. So Dr. Thalen, what are your thoughts as a higher education executive on the current challenges and market trends in higher education? Well, thanks, Steve. Um, as you see up here on the slide, uh, we have a number of issues that we prevented, presented here in heat map format, uh, showing the, the prevalence uh, and priority that uh, you and your peers generally assign to the issues that you see on the screen. More generally, as the post-pandemic disruptions continue to plague higher education, many innovative leaders in higher education have reprioritized their focus to meet the institution's needs around enrollment and end-to-end -end constituent or stakeholder experiences. And here we're thinking about students, parents, faculty, staff, alumni. We're talking about managing the proliferation of emerging technologies, addressing increased security risk and sustainability initiatives that we have here. Before we move on uh, and I add a little more general perspective, uh, we're gonna offer a poll for you to identify the top three priorities or topics of interest uh, that you see as being top of mind. So I'm gonna bring them on the screen now and I'm gonna give you a couple of seconds here, maybe up to 30 to 45 seconds 
please identify your top three priorities and challenges that you believe your institution is facing. Uh, and again, I'll give a couple of seconds here for everyone to participate on the screen uh, and we'll present the results of this, the priority assessment uh, before we move on. like we're getting a couple of responses coming in. All you need to do is click on the open boxes and your responses will be automatically recorded. We're approaching almost 50% participation right now, so please feel free to share your assessment here. I'll leave it open for about another 20 seconds. Okay, we're nearing just about two thirds. I'll give us just a couple of more seconds here before I bring up the results. All right, then turning to the results that we have uh, from a uh, pretty substantial majority of our participants today. Uh, it looks like attracting and retaining students uh, was top of mind for everybody, but digital transformation and uh, it looks like operational efficiency are the next two by quite a substantial margin uh, with uh, a smattering of interest in some of the other clearly important uh, topics and priorities, but not top of mind with our audience here today. Well, let's move on then. Um, oh, actually, before we do so, uh, does anybody on the CGI panel, um, uh, Derek, uh, Simon, uh, or Mike, want to comment on these results? Do you see anything significant here? Clearly, attracting and retaining students is, is a number one priority. Ensure, ensuring that our students achieve what they set out to do is, is critical and that, and that there's a many there's many factors to that safety accessibility and just the well well-being and being part of a dynamic environment I think that really comes through that survey well thanks Simon and uh, and I agree and in many ways it really sets up our our conversation well I'm going to take just a moment here before we jump right into the digital-led university conversation today. Uh, we all know these trends in higher education. We know that the pandemic depressed enrollment. Uh, we know and have read about uh, pockets of growth with international enrollment coming back uh, and being a place where institutions can look uh, to really drive up uh, enrollment if uh, in-state or, or um, Traditional enrollments are not as strong. Non-traditional enrollment is growing pretty substantially as well. Well, what does that really mean, especially when we consider everyone's uh, top priority assessment here for attracting and retaining students? Institutions today all want to be student focused. There's lots of ways that that's described. It's student focused every day. It's student centric. It's how do we improve the student experience? But really what we're here today to talk about is that student experience, not just the student experience, all stakeholder experiences, and what that looks like today in a digital institution. The academic experience now is very much digital heavy, digital centric. Student services are digital centric today. Any type of engagement, particularly through the pandemic, happened in a digital way. We also think about the mobile experience with so many students and other stakeholders interacting with our institutions through mobile devices and what the overall digital experience looks like because of that is really what we're going to focus on here today. And that's the driving force behind the digital ed university model. 
So I'm gonna introduce Simon now to talk us through uh, the beginnings of the digital-led university journey. Terrific, thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's uh, very challenging times. New, we're in a new situation. We've come out of the pandemic with, with some great opportunities though. New universities, that are new drives from universities that are going, I can, I, can, I can go and reach much further with the opportunities that are in front of me, but it does present a certain amount of challenge. Uh, we're seeing uh, the need for sustainability, both financially and green, of course, but also, how, how do you get the foundations right to become truly innovative places whilst also keeping the lights on, which has, as, as we have had to do over the last few years. So CGR have worked with our clients and wider stakeholders and partners across the piece to create this digital-led uni university prop proposition. And it's absolutely an outside-in review. So we've looked widely across all the stakeholders considering all needs. We do focus on students, of course, but academia, staff, the supplier network, um, how, how we connect that entire ecosystem. And of course, our, our other stakeholders, some of those funders, those industry, par industry partners, those research partners will want to work with these institutions that are absolutely ahead of the game on innovation and setting the field. And, th and that funding, of their the key drives of innovation and those key themes around sustainability. So throughout, we've had, there have been some noticeably standout themes. You can see many of them here. Um, retention, entertainment, absolutely is coming through, uh, uh, but driven by experience as well, from that first touch through your life in the university and then as an alumni, you know, personalized experience that support the university with um, a, a branding, if you like, that creates an image of inclusiveness, well-being, diversity, and also that sustainability thing. Our students are really, really in touch with what's happening in terms of climate change and our need to move things forward. And the university should be the place where we, where we set the standards and where we provide them with learnings that they can take into their future employment. So proactive data strategies and driving and driving policy at the top are absolutely the number one priority to achieve this. Every conversation I'm having begins with, how do we get our data strategy in the right place? And how do I, as a, an IT organization particularly, how do I get to the top table delivering proactive change as, 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 as part of the story at board level? And what, a, a thing that supports this, if we, if we, is um, the, the digital-led campus. Beyond experience into the digital-led campus. So how, how do we create as many cities, universities that have the opportunity to rapidly create data-driven supportive use cases? The, 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 they can, the, these use cases can of course be scaled. We've got our mini cities are the perfect place to rapidly develop use cases that deliver real outcomes. So they can be scaled, adding value to our place in, in our cities, in our regions, in partnership with our civic providers. So what we, what we focused on here is, is helping universities and institutions produce a digital-led campus roadmap. That's gonna be key to making this happen, give, giving ourselves confidence in return on investment, but also delivery of the outcomes. Uh, ultimately, creating all that lovely data, we have the opportunity to create digital twins so that we can proactively and without danger and protection to our budgets, create surety of spend and investment. And if we look at some of those use cases, if we look at the uh, use cases along the bottom, you can see some major themes there, a myriad of opportunities. We need to quickly drill into the width of outcome possible and come up with with answers as to as to where to go safety movement facilities surface optimization well-being and pedagogy can all be enabled with an internet of things supported digital led campus and as a best of breed technology agnostic supplier we bring business cases that support the delivery of this roadmap and the innovation know how know how to bring it to life to bring the best that's out there in terms of subject matter experts, 
in, in incubators, SMEs, and some of the big players, integrating services to create a real omni-channel experience uh, with a single pane of glass dashboard. This is key so that we can real time see what's going on so that, and we can have a predictive view so we can rapidly respond to change and incidents with all that in, those great integrations we need across, across our uh, application landscape. There's a key, another key part of this, of course, as we create these opportunities with sensors and technology, we create risk. We've got to manage that risk. We have to manage the edge. And so we have security layer, security theme running through this that, that, that again delivers alongside our major strategies around cloud services, sustainability, and of course, communication, collaboration, making it all happen. And that gives us the information we need to achieve those green financial sustainability targets. We see the digital journey as interactive and it's customized for an, an individual's needs. We find that every university is different. Every university has a different start point. So we have to do this in partnership. So we embed teams to ensure that accessibility, diversity, inclusion, that are part of the foundation of this approach so that everybody this is happening. So ultimately we enhance everybody's experience and we get closer to that goal of creating the green and financially sustainable university. Over to you. Hi, Simon. Uh, thank you. Uh, so being best in breed in terms of inclusion means becoming an institution of choice for non-traditional learners and staff, um, such as those with uh, who are English language learners or uh, individuals with disability. And web accessibility is the technical framework that brings it all together. Your organizations can actually leverage digital inclusion to perform a lot better in this regard. So why do we, why, why are we uh, investing in diversity and inclusion? The most important reason is everybody deserves an equitable access to knowledge and education, and the Re Americans with Disabilities Act reinforces that. And accessibility isn't just for people with traditional physical disabilities. Um, these improvements and these features can help everybody. If you look at the picture of the family walking down the beach mat at the beach, well, that's designed for people who use wheelchairs and have mobility disabilities. But I think we can all agree our day just got easier when we're lugging 100 pounds of gear down the beach with our family. That's a great example of universal design. Also, finding and retaining good staff is getting harder by the day. Uh, diversity and inclusion empowers the staff you do have who may have individual needs to help your organization meet its goals. And with declining enrollments, it's more important than ever to reach a larger pool of potential students, such as those um, who are English language learners or foreign students, individuals with disabilities. And that extends to not just physical disabilities, but also cognitive disabilities like learning um, impairments. Uh, and by becoming an institution of choice, you're really positioning yourself to be more competitive for that pool of uh, potential students. Uh, so talking about uh, cognitive disability and learning disabilities, it's really important that your systems are interoperable and meet certain standards. For example, that will allow you to implement features like um, automatic eye tracking where you can uh, you can see that the user has lost their focus and you can switch up the mode of learning for that user. Um, also, the interoperability allows uh, interaction with assistive, uh, all assistive technology without having to vet each individual piece of uh, technology the user or the learner could be utilizing. Uh, and this interoperability, interoperability actually extends to a whole bunch of compliance standards, such as the ADA, Section 508, um, WCAG. But accessibility really does 
extend over to the other compliance standards like FISMA, FERPA, even NIST and ISO. Uh, it's all inter, you know, it's all intertwined. Uh, so, what? How do you strategize becoming more diverse and inclusive? Um, well, you do that by focusing on accessibility. One is u- utilizing universal design to establish a baseline of interoperability. And you, you strive to have your, uh, to meet a principle named POUR, P-O-U-R, where your systems are perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust by all users. And then you take inclusive design to extend the experience and make it for the individual uh, student or staff member. So there's a few different um, technologies out there that are accessibility enhancers. Uh, As you see on the screen, there's like a contrast changer, the text, the font resizer. Um, Those are all, those don't fix the root cause. At the end of the day, um, those should be uh, interoperable with the existing uh, technologies that people use. Uh, in addition, uh, there's other products out there such as overlays. The accessibility and the disability community has largely rejected those. Um, they do not fix the root cause of the, prog- of the problem. They just dress it up a little bit. Uh, so be careful of, of organizations that overpromise um, accessibility. Uh, this is uh, there's no shortcuts. It has it's an investment, but there's definitely a benefit and uh, a return on that investment. Uh, so accessibility f- affects a lot of areas of um, the organization. Uh, cost of add-ons uh, such as these create overhead, security concerns, and they don't fix the root. Uh, text-to-speech widgets, a lot of those do processing on remote servers and then feed the information back. That all has to be tested and monitored for vulnerabilities increasing costs. But by meeting the standards of interoperability, you ensure you, 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 you won't have those issues, but you'll also be able to integrate with human, ser- uh, uh, human resource information systems, ERPs, and so on. So by building accessibility into your operations, you can lower your cost. Uh, By accelerating development priorities instead of remediating, you can also um, establish a compliant universal design baseline and allowing your uh, organization to really focus on that inclusive piece and extending the the experience to the individual's needs. So... um, that being said, uh, a few stats, uh, you know, those automated tools out there, they only catch about half of the errors. Uh, the cost of non-compliance is conservatively three times higher than complying in the first place. And we should all remember one in four people will acquire a disability in their lifetime. And as the population's adoption of general technology increases in ages, so will demand for compliance and interoperability with their own technologies. So it's always most, uh, more secure, cost-effective, and efficient to start with being accessible and inclusive um, as a basic requirement. So thank you for, uh, thank you for uh, listening. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of areas that we can, uh, we can address with uh, diversity and inclusion based on the polls, and it's all part of technology transformation. Derek, thanks a lot for sharing the importance of accessibility through the various lenses and and issues that you just led us through the discussion of. Um, just a quick note for the audience as well, we will have an opportunity for questions at the end. Uh, if you do think of questions, you can type them in right now and we will have them available when we finish uh, the presentation portion of our, our webinar today. But for now, um, clearly we've got a lot to think about on the digital journey that we're discussing today. Simon, do you want to talk about the digital backbone and how that supports this journey? Sure. This this is absolutely about that piece we were talking about, about how do you keep the lights on and yet create this, this innovative world that we need to, to deliver and the opportunities and take, take a hold of those opportunities and really seize what we have. Um, the backbone is... Is, is part of 
a it's, it's part of looking at the stakeholder resource impacts and, and have we found that many of our partners often require help with some of the basics around target operating models, how to get into the right place as, as a building block to, to create those supporting functions so we can develop rapidly what we would call the foundations to be sure that the digital led university can, can be created on that successful roadmap and flourish. So we've taken our global experience and condensed that into the higher education backbone. So it's underneath those data-led themes. You can see it looks rather like a vertebrae. There's 10 key, 10 key components, um, some of which you've mentioned already, you, but you'll recognize other items here like um, cloud strategy. How do we get that right? Enterprise-wide SIAM, you know, how, how do we potentially take um, ITSM and, and bring it to, to add real value across the, the width of the organization. And of course, supporting that unified communications. So this at its basic level could be seen as a resource augmentation model, bringing people in to help you uh, with the management of non-core services and other areas such as security operations. CGI is here though, to develop, to develop and work with you as a, as a partner and this, this is intended as the foundations of a partnering experience, embedded teams working alongside your teams, but adding value, business cases, and uh, return on investment ultimately. And I, I, I used the best of brief phase earlier. As you can see some big names on here. Uh, CGI really do consider the best out there. And we apply that to these business cases. We a great partner is all about not necessarily looking from inside out, but to looking from the university to us and going, what is best to deliver that solution? What's best to deliver to hit some of those high level ambitious outcomes? So the, the ecosystem, our ecosystem is very much built on, on innovation. We are a transformer. We have, we have an R&D mindset, very similar to the university sector. And when enabled by our partners, we bring the best to challenge and pump and transform things. I think that that's probably best exemplified in our approach to emerging technology. It's bewildering. And of course, every university is experimenting, using and research projects, many different technologies. And how, how do you bring all that together? And how do you, how do you catalyze that? to become something more dynamic potentially across operations as well as um, research and pedagogy. So as we said before, our students have an expectation where they want to be is a place where it's, it's one of innovations. They're making choices of place of learning based on organizations that really make their eyes light up. So, and they also want to know they're gonna be joining an institution of constant innovation they want after their period to come out with real skills, meaningful skills. And I think this is gonna help with choice. And that first outcome that we talked about, which was retention. How do we keep the guys interested, happy and excited about the place they're, they're with? So keeping up with technological advancements, right up, right up there. Um, intelligent automation, absolutely up there so that our staff can assist with students real needs rather than the rigmarole in the back office of, um, of processing things so we apply a lot of these technologies we also look at data you know, insight through analytics data both strategic and applied ai and machine learning being foundations of pro proactivity allowing us to again to help our staff to do the important things in their roles and themselves become more fulfilled. Robotic process automation, a, a, an often used word, potentially un, underused in the sector, just to, just to help us with those foundations, to get the operations in the right place. And again, focus on the human end interface. interface. Geospatial support, bringing our advanced satellite-based data expertise to bear. We do a tremendous amount of satellite technology and it absolutely supports our, our um, drive around the use of data, all data, both local and what we can find from a geospatial perspective. 
And I think everybody on here will be in some way experimenting with AR, using AR in research cases. You know, every university has um, an interest also with what's coming, what's next. And C CGI wants to be at the forefront of helping universities be well ahead of that game. So rather like the digital campus, the university is the perfect small ecosystem to develop those use cases. And you can see the, the metaverse word at the end of the aug aug augmented reality line. We are sharing our own experiences, onboarding people, uh, onboarding all our staff with the metaverse now as, as a policy in the, in the UK um, to, to learn and develop on how we can use this new technology. It's, the metaverse is largely undefined. A visualization of the internet sounds like chaos. We, we, can get, we can get on the front foot and actually use it to the best um, within our institution. Um, beginning with that first view of the university from home, you know, we, looking at the, the bewildering number of choices out there, you want to go to the place that, that you can go and visit and tour uh, from home using the metaverse potentially. And even simple things like those first couple of months where um, our, our professors are constantly being irritated by the student asking which where room number 106 is. Um, that will go away. So, and then probably more seriously, safe places. Safe places where students and research partners can interact in a level playing field of learning experience. We think that's pretty exciting. So you've got a place where anybody can join in. Anybody can, anybody can potentially reach out live, real time and research partners jointly working with us on, on experimentation to see where their investment is going in, in a real-time, real-world experience. And of course, if you connect that to the digital campus, the Internet, the Internet of Things capability where we're bringing data together you, and that digital twin, we could actually potentially bring the, bring the digital campus completely visually to life with the metaverse, that's really exciting. So you actually visualize changes, walk around the camp campus and imagine what a new facility might look like and then trial it without actually putting a spade in the ground. So if you wrap all that together, we're calling this essentially innovation as a service, innovation as a partner. It's partner-based engagement models pulling all that story together and you have that IAAS, innovation as a service, faster, better, safer, continual innovation mindset that we all need to compete, flourish and retain and support attainment of our students. Sustainability is a key theme for us. We, we are um, recently uh, rated as the top 1% globally in uh, sustainability by Echo Vardis. Uh, we, we've, there's a lot of lessons we learned through that, and we want to bring that to the sector. It's a supporting theme. Um, in, in the UK, we, we are proud to say we're gonna hit net zero by 2026. There's a lot of strategies that supported that, our own four-step process, and we want to bring that to bear to the sector. There's a lot of learnings around supply chains, how to support your supply chains, how to mentor, bringing them into the story, new strategies, but, and science-based targets, targets that are meaningful, not offsetting, but universities actually being known for supporting um, sustainability targets and sustainability initiatives that are actually having an impact now. We think this process can really help. And I mentioned the ecosystem. Again, a lot of names, a lot of names on this slide and, and, and as, I, uh, you, as you'd expect, we're, we're, we're best of breed. We choose the right partners. And there's some bright lights on here that you would recognize. But I think something that, that's missing off this slide is that it's supplemented by our partners, which are the sector. As places of innovation and experiment, the ecosystem is constantly being updated by local SMEs and you creating SMEs yourself, innovating and incubating, and that can be applied to the partnership as well. Um, and we want to embrace that completely. And it's, and it's part of uh, 
our, our joint social value commitments. Um, let's 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 create local innovation. So one of the most important aspects of the journey is to ensure we protect the data and fortify our ecosystem. We talked about the risk we're creating as, as the innovation across uh, the Internet of Things. It's, it's, it's undeniably powerful, but we need to be careful with our data. We need to, we need to keep threat vectors away from the university. I wonder, Mike, could you help us understand how to balance this enterprise platform security requirements with the need for innovation and the deployment of some of these emerging technologies? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Simon. Yes, uh, so um, I want to go ahead and move on here and talk a little bit about the value of security. Now, earlier we polled the audience and 27% of you put security in the uh, top three priorities that you saw. So this slide's really not for you. This is for the other 70% to reconsider uh, where you would put security at inside of that. And I want to talk a little bit about how we grow business and whether that's student enrollment uh, or the partnerships that we may form with the U.S. federal government, such as Department of Energy or Transportation, Health, Department of Defense, and the connections we want to make there for grants, for studies. Uh, all of those organizations want to know that they're operating in a safe uh, and secure environment where they don't have uh, uh, as many risks uh, associated with the type of information that they want to share and partner with you. There's a tremendous amount of value inside of that. Uh, having said that, the protection of intellectual property um, that you're creating and in the, in the information and in the outcomes in the, of the studies and the research are all very, very valuable, uh, kind of giving insights to where maybe a, a, a policy, a, a federal policy or a state policy may start to go. Um, we create some uh, the value in that. that. Uh, also, though, your physical systems that are there as well. Uh, there's different types of folks that may be interested in just, you know, uh, uh, disrupting the, the smart technology that you're using on your campus to, to delay or degrade uh, your, uh, your, your types of uh, studies that you're doing. Um, want to talk, you know, one of the things that also in earlier in the poll was business reputation. You know, if something happens to a university uh, and it gets negative publicity out there, that that inf also shapes the ideas of um, the folks that you're trying to attract to to come to your to your uh, university uh, to to study or to or to partner with. And then finally, everyone, the faculty, the staff, the uh, the, the students, everyone wants to uh, feel like that their data is being protected in a way that, um, you know, safeguards them from these, these types of threats that we're, we're worried about. And uh, so I, I want to talk a little bit about threats. This is not a, a uh, try to scare you slide. Uh, this is, though, the reality that we work in. And if you look at the actors on the left, uh, you can see that there's different motivations that a threat actor may have uh, to come into your organization and take that take that uh, information from you. And then on the right, you can see the different types of ways that uh, the, those threat actors use. And and while you're while you're looking at that, I want you to think about your your campus, your university, how you operate. And you know some of the rules are you know we we want to share information. We want freedom of information. Uh, we want we you have these large networks that may have bring your own devices or Internet of Things access uh, to it. You have and then it, you have this tremendous amount of confidential information that you're having, whether it's personal information, whether it's credit card information, uh, whether it's health information, uh, whether it's the research that you're doing and the intellectual property property. All of that are, are things that threat actors want to go after and, and get their hands on. And some results of that were uh, over the last, um, uh, at least in 2021, 26 uh, different colleges and universities uh, got uh, succumbed to uh, ransomware attacks. And uh, this year in 22, uh, as of June, uh, we're already up 44% by then. And the average cost of those attacks has been estimated around 2.7. I've seen different studies that have different ranges, but $2.7 million uh, for that average cost. But that's not the real problem. The other problem is it also takes you time to recover from uh, uh, these ransomware attacks. And, and at the end of the day, only 2% of the universities that got attacked in 2021 got all of their data back. Some got 
compartments or parts of it, and some of the data was then um, had integrity problems. Uh, some, of, some of it was also available other places. So those threats are, are actually real and, uh, and need to be considered as you're, as you're developing your strategies and you're developing your plans as you go into the, um, as you go into the future using those technologies that Simon just presented to us. Uh, so a little bit about how you can protect yourself. And, and you know, this is, this is obviously a CGI component, but there's some tenants in here that, that, that need to jump out. And the first thing is risk management. Uh, we need to manage our risks and security is all about managing risks. And there is a governance piece to this. There is a compliance piece, but security in the form is about risk management. And to do that, you have to understand what's going on in your environment. So as all this new technology comes in or you're thinking about uh, integrating some new technology in or the shadow IT groups that are out there that are bringing uh, different uh, technology in without you even knowing about it are starting to expose your risk to make it even higher. Um, and as you're going through this process, as you're making the transformation into some of these new and new technologies, you'll want to have a good service framework, a transformation framework that controls the uh, the ways that, that the new technology and it gives you a view of the risks and the maturity so that you can balance and scale and prioritize your uh, and then ultimately justify the security that you're doing back to your stakeholders so that they understand what you're doing. Also uh, want to talk a little bit about uh, you, understanding where the privacy is in this uh, organization here uh, com and your compliance. Uh, you need to understand the impact of the privacy, your health and your rec and any recommendations that come out of that. User training and awareness. So we're gonna, you know, beyond phishing uh, uh, emails, beyond user awareness, the training of this new technology, how do you supply it? How do you use it correctly? Then also you wanna look at your supply chain. Who are you choosing? What are those partners that you're choosing? Are, are, they, are they doing the due diligence to make sure that their, uh, um, that their, uh, their products, their services are all up to date and how are they doing it? And then finally, in the worst cases, you know, you need to be prepared for a crisis. If a cyber security crisis happens, you'll want to be able to have an incident response plan that includes not only the actions you're taking, but how you communicate and, and how you uh, communicate externally and internally to what's going on uh, as these things uh, evolve. And then, you know, lastly here, I uh, want to kind of finish up. These are, these are just some of the services that you can look at to understand and you know, at the end of the day, uh, risk management falls in that vulnerability management. We want to be able to understand that. We want to understand our risks very, very well. And then we want to apply the management strategies to them to mitigate, uh, uh, avoid, or transfer uh, those types of risks. And then uh, your threat intelligence, you, you'll want to understand what threats are actively targeting you, even though uh, uh, you you may get a drive-by by a, a obscure group that's actually looking for uh, financial or insurance. If you have a vulnerability that threat actor would want to take advantage of and uh, knows the techniques to do it, they they may go ahead and decide that you are now their target, even on a uh, drive-by. Maybe it's uh, analysis that you need. Maybe you need some uh, assistance inside of uh, looking at what do these things mean, what's going on within all these different uh, technologies that we're using. You'll definitely need to have some type of incident response and digital forensics uh, capability. Sometimes it may go all the way up to a legal situation uh, where you're investigating into something and you'll need to make sure that that data is, is protected throughout its life cycle uh, so that you can use it in a court. We mentioned phishing a little bit earlier. Absolutely, uh, the, one of the number one vectors that a threat actor uses is to send a fish in to a, a privileged user, get their credentials and move forward. Uh, we, need to, we need to identify, we need to train the, and, and get the behavior uh, of our organizations to understand when, what a phishing email looks like, how it's constructed, so that when they see it, they can recognize it, report it, so that we can then defend about it. And, and the, one of the harder things to do is this predictive monitoring. And this is kind of looking forward to like, what do we see that's gonna happen next? And, and I'll just give you an example. Like uh, multi-factor authentication is, is 
is widespread right now. Everywhere you go, people talk about multi-factor authentication, but there will come a time when uh, the breakdown of those, those techniques and multi-factor authentication are figured out by those threat actors and they will figure out how to get in front of it. So therefore you have to have a different mechanism uh, or a, a technology you can transfer to um, be able to, uh, be able to uh, respond to things along those lines. I think we have a polling question. Now, given that we said all this, we have another poll. And uh, given, uh, so I'll read it here, given the opportunities of digital transformation, how secure do you believe your institution is from threat actors in such an environment? And I'll give a few minutes here for everyone to start answering. Okay, it looks like we're getting some more particip participation. Okay. I'm going to give about 30 more seconds here. Okay, well, let's see how this turned out. Okay, all right. Well, 44% is uh, saying that you are ready uh, for, to deal with threat actors uh, given all the uh, changes that are going on. And then, oh, it's an even split here uh, with minor and uh, major helpings. And, uh, and I see a, a lower percentage for uh, ready and uh, are not ready. And if, uh, yeah, so we, you know, we're here to help. If, uh, you know, you keep your friends close, your enemies closer, and your partners even closer than that is the, is the final takeaway. And with that, I believe we go to Q&A. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, that was really insightful. Uh, given the changing landscape and higher education requirements, the influx of external devices, students accessing higher ed's infrastructure literally 24-7, it's good to know that an institution can address risk and protect its environment with the different managed options that you talked about. I wanna thank everyone in our expert panel for walking us through this digital journey today. Uh, we do have uh, several minutes left for questions. We've had a couple of questions come in uh, through the Q&A box. Um, so uh, I'll start with those. And as I do that, uh, please do use the Q&A box to type in your question and we'll keep going uh, through our allotted time trying to get through the questions that have come in. Uh, Mike, if you uh, can stay with us here, uh, it looks like we've got a couple of security questions right off the bat. Uh, first question that came in, what are some suggestions or best practices that you can share to secure systems and protect students in a remote learning environment? Yeah, so uh, one suggestion is in a, in a remote learning environment is you want to authenticate not only uh, the person who is accessing the system, but also the device. So uh, some MDM solutions are out there where you can in place a, um, you know, a, a containerized environment that the, that the um, uh, individual will use to, to get into a, on the system and then use different credentials to connect into uh, your environment, uh, possibly jumping into a, a, a virtual desktop environment uh, on the enterprise. And from there, they could work out as well. So uh, these, are, these are some uh, traditional uh, type of solutions that exist and uh, are, are, quite, uh, uh, are quite useful. It's, you know, it's just you have to balance the cost uh, against the risk that you're trying to protect against. 
I, and if I might, Mike, uh, building on that and something I alluded to a moment ago, uh, another question that's come in, how do you balance security against providing a good user experience to students, just, just as a general matter? That's a, that's a great question. This is a very difficult uh, thing because a lot, you know, individual experiences will, will differ. Some people uh, you know, are, are very comfortable in moving through technology and others are not. Uh, so when you, when you, but the controls that you want to put around the data is going to depend on the sensitivity of the data. Uh, so as you start to go up the stack, you may have, you will have more controls to protect that highly confidential, highly sensitive uh, information. The uh, experience though should be similar uh, based on the person and, and employing uh, activities such as a zero trust architecture uh, putting in uh, 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 biometrics or MFA to make it easier for uh, for uh, a a um, an entity being a device or a person to be understood and authorized to move forward are some things that you may want to consider as you put into your environment to get to get to that type of information. And I wonder if I might take advantage of my role as moderator to, to take that question maybe in a slightly different direction, given what we heard from Derek about accessibility, and that is balancing security with the need for accessibility for the various populations that, that will need um, that kind of support. Uh, I wonder, Derek, is there is there any uh, thought there? Yeah, so by... Creating exceptions to interoperability in your system, you're actually creating vulnerabilities. Um, so meeting the standards is really not just an accessibility piece, but it gives um, you know actors or you know managers like Mike the the ability to say, hey, you know, I know this meets the standard, therefore it's a secure platform or a secure baseline to work off. Uh, when you start making exceptions and accommodations with third-party widgets and tools, um, the, the work of monitoring and, you know, testing, and not just that, think about SOC compliance and, and NIST and ISO, you know, that might even require trips to their physical location depending on the level of security required. So by making your systems uh, compliant with the accessibility standards, you alleviate the need to go down that road. Great, I think uh, next question, uh, I think is right in uh, Simon's wheelhouse. Do you see an increase in the adoption of hyper automation in higher education? That's a really good question. And, and it's, and you've got to be careful where you, where you, where you ask that question, actually, because many of our institutions have well established you know, centuries old, old uh, infrastructures that have gradually evolved. And certainly the last three, three years have, have, have just, as we said before, you know, kept, kept the lights on. So sometimes you get a real sucking of teeth. Going, you know, it's, uh, so it's, and, and the answer is always it has to come from the top. You know, to break down these sides, it's got to be a decision uh, to change things. I, th I think it's happening slowly. I think in, in, in other areas of, of um, citizen service, um, the back office is it's, it's well-established practice. You know, the, the back office has been hit with technologies by RPA and breaking down and changing some of these silos. We do need to look outside in, and I think the outside in bit is where it is really happening. That's, that's where it's starting. So collaboration. You know, using AI, chatbots, um, effective use of the web, um, conversational based based assistance. Those those are slowly come in coming in, but there's uh, there's a lot of lot, lot of uh, I, I don't know about the right words vested interest, but there, there's a lot of silos that potentially could work much better together to support that transformation. And that 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 has to be a decision from the top. It's got to, it's got to be a push from the top, hundred percent. So that's going to slow that down. Front end, yes. Back office, it's lower. Simon, I, he I heard you mention RPA again. Uh, we had a, an earlier question about best practices. What are some best practice suggestions to start the planning process around an emerging tech like RPA? 
Yeah, that's that, that very much linked to the, the answer to the previous question. Understand the silos, look at processes, um, dig into those processes, ask, ask an honest question around who is delivering what against that outside in view. So look contact strategy in, look communication in, and then think how we can prioritize change in the back office. Wonder uh, we, we had a number of sure sorry sorry to talk over you Simon uh, we had a number of security questions so I'll come back to uh, Mike if I might uh, to give you a heads up Mike um, besides regular internal phishing training what other measures can we implement to mitigate general ransomware risk well uh, uh, ransomware is a is a is a great topic in general so uh, I'll I'll start with the high level. Uh, over the past two years, uh, overall ransomware attacks have went down. The Conti Group broke up uh, last oh. year. Uh, they just come, they're just going to spread out and they're going to go into another group, but uh, and other groups and start other avenues. But uh, but not for education. Education it actually went up, and I'm not sure if it's so much of a soft target uh, that they see with uh, within the education market, but. Uh, uh, but it has, you know, the, the, from what we're seeing, everything is starting to go up. If you talk to insurance uh, companies, they'll tell you their number one payment is for ransomware. And um, so you mentioned about, you know, what are some things that you can do? Uh, and it, there is training the workforce. There's making them aware of ransomware, what it looks like, the phishing attempts that come out, the user awareness and training, clean desk policies, uh, complex passwords, MFA, all of those things uh, need to be uh, put into a standard and pushed out. Uh, what what we see the attack vectors though that that the um, uh, threat actors are using are um, they're other than a phishing attempt is uh, getting a access to priv uh, uh, privileged users using RDP. Um, or vulnerability management. That is, you have vulnerabilities that are accessible, internet-facing, uh, that a threat actor can exploit, move into your network, uh, gain, gain control of your Active Directory domains, and therefore, uh, you know, basically they have the keys to the kingdom. At that point, they can encrypt and do what they want to do. So and really protecting that IT force and letting the IT force understand how important their credentials are there's additional controls you can put on your IT force uh, with privilege access for those domain controllers. Uh, you, you definitely want to have MFA involved with every one of them uh, to uh, to prevent these types of attacks. And I think with that, given our time, I'll turn it back to Steve. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Steven. Um, thanks, everyone, and all the experts. Um, for your insights, extremely insightful. And thank you for to all the participants, audience, for uh, spending your hour with us today. Um, so this will conclude our discussion today, but if you have any additional questions or if you're interested in continuing the discussion, please contact us via our uh, follow-up show that we'll be sending out shortly. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Thank you, everybody.